Hello, and welcome to another episode of Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. Our mission here at Higher Aim is to encourage hearts and empower lives. One of the ways we accomplish this mission is through our daily devotion email. Each devotion includes a passage of scripture and an insightful message that will encourage you and guide you in your study of God's word. These devotions are completely free and you can sign up today to begin receiving the daily email. Simply go to higheraim.org and click the button on the homepage that says sign up for the daily email devotions. You can also call our help center at 1-800-491-4400 as operators are standing by now to help you register for the email. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message from Dr. Kurt Dodd. I'm glad you're here. Why don't you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. We are looking at Revelation chapter 9, and this is a very powerful chapter. And you and I need to understand that there is something different happening here. It's kind of like when I was growing up, there were uh, several teachers in our church growing up, and, and uh, I'd see them in all the church services, and, and I knew that they taught, and, uh, and I'd go up and visit with them when I was a student and, uh, and enjoy them, but then I would see them in school, and their position was a little bit different. Uh, uh, I didn't get any special um, treatment because I went to church with them. Uh, they were professional, and they were very directive. And the relationship was different. On one side, it was this. One side, it was that. Both of them were equally important. And I think that that's where we are today in the midst of the study because we are going to see a glimpse of Jesus that we're not accustomed to. Why don't you follow along with me as we read beginning in verse 13 through verse 21. The Bible says this, the sixth angel sounded his trumpet And I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes having heads with which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or thefts. Wow. I mean, that's a sobering passage. And you and I, we need to understand that it's there for us to understand what is coming. During the Great Tribulation period, of which the latter part of the seven years of the judgment of God falls on the earth is greater than 
the judgment of the first half, we are shaken to realize that things are not going to get better for humankind. I don't care what you hear or what you see or what the political foundation is and environment emotionally in our culture, I need to tell you, based upon what I read in Scripture, it ain't getting any better. In fact, the truth is, after God catches his children up, and raptures them from the face of this planet, it is literally the judgment of God begins to fall on this planet. And the reason that we are reading this and that you and I need to understand this is that we need to have a mentality of who's going to win. We also need to have the mentality that we don't have long. And as we see the intensity of what is happening in our culture, both in the medical arena, the financial arena, the cultural arena, it ought to be a wake-up call to, to all of us to realize we don't have long. And what we do accomplish for the kingdom of God ought to be done with great intensity and a sense of urgency because we are representatives of the Lord during this time, and we are to be the agents of reconciliation, if you will. We are ambassadors for Christ, the Bible calls us in 2 Corinthians 5.20. And that's, that is very important. But we need to learn what this says, and you need to get a glimpse of what is to come so possibly it will call you into a sense of urgency to tell other people that they can miss this. That's very, very important. Because if they go into the tribulation period, this is what faces your family and your friends who do not know Christ. So we got to be busy. Let's look at this. There in verse 13, we see one voice heard and obeyed. That's very interesting. One voice that is heard and obeyed. Now, who is this voice that comes from the four horns of the altar? By the way, the horns were used to strap down the sacrifice. Now, undoubtedly, it speaks of the one, with a capital O, the one who was sacrificed for our sins, none other than Jesus. He is the one that holds all the keys to both life and death. You need to understand, Jesus is king and he is in charge, and that's very important. However, I told you when we began this study of the book of Revelation that the picture we see of Jesus in the book of Revelation is completely different than in the Gospels. In the Gospels, we see him as Savior, in the book of Revelation, we see him as judge. And many of us, we whiplash with that because our picture of Jesus is kind of milk toast, always loving, always a smile, always open arms. But here, this picture, it's totally different. It is one of releasing judgment upon this planet. And the early Christians who were being persecuted by the entire world needed to know that in the end, God reigns. And he reigns now, even in the midst of unbelievable terror and horror. And that's important for you and I to realize. You see, we are seeing Jesus as personally right now as Savior. One day, the world will see him as judge, and he will make things right. It's like the old story that Warren Wiersbe tells in his book, Meet Yourself in the Psalms. And he tells of a frontier town that uh, had an experience on the main street where a horse bolted and ran away w with the, the buggy. And a little boy was playing in the middle of the street of the town and a young man saw what was getting ready to happen. 
that that horse was getting ready to run over that little boy. And he jumped into action and swooped him up in his hands and saved his life from a tragic death. Unfortunately, years later, that young man would become a lawless, reckless thief and murderer. And he was finally arrested and brought to trial. And as he sat there, he looked at the judge and realized he knew who he was. And then the light went on. He was the man that had saved his life as a, a young boy. And then having a chance to speak before the court, he mentioned to the judge, you were the one that saved me. You were the one that kept my life alive. I plead for mercy based upon that you saved me. And the judge solemnly looked at him and said, once I was your savior, now I am your judge. You see, un understand this, that right now we have the privilege, the honor of receiving Christ as our Savior. But if we choose to turn from him, we will face him as judge. You go, I just like Jesus the Savior. <clears throat> you need to hear this. He is judge and Savior. <clears throat> and it's important <clears throat> that you and I grab hold of that. And that's the picture of this chapter. Jesus as the judge. And then there's another picture here that we see four angels released to kill. This is uh, uh, horrifying that it is Jesus, the one who's speaking from the altar, who releases these four angels to kill. These angels have been bound for a season, and they are released for a reason. And that's important for us to grab hold of, that nothing happens on this planet that God does not give permission to. Now, you might not like that statement, but that is true. He is in charge, and he binds things and individuals and happenings for a reason, but they are released eventually. And that is a description. By the way, the Euphrates was the boundary line of the promised land that was given to the children of Israel. You go, if God's in charge of everything, why does he let bad things happen to good people? Thanks for asking that question. I'd like to answer it very quickly. Because the Bible literally describes that there is no one who does good. You know, many of us, we think, uh, good people shouldn't get uh, judged or bad things shouldn't happen to, to good people. Well, the Bible says that there is no one that does good. There in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, we read these words. Listen to this. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. You've heard me say before, if God really gave us what we deserve, he would have taken us out by the time we hit two years old. And that's the truth. So we need to remember that no one is good. <laughs> Number two, he allows us to reap what we sow. I don't like that, honestly. But that's a principle in Scripture, that God allows us to reap what we sow. There in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, we read these words. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. What Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. 
That principle of reaping what you sow is very important. And many of us, as we've heard before, you know, sometimes we sow our wild oats and then we pray for crop failure. But the unfortunate thing is, is that God allows us to experience the results of our actions. Now, forgiveness, yes. But the real truth is, God allows what we have invested to produce whatever results of that investment. And that's important. As well as, you and I need to realize that the result of sin in the world is death. There in Romans 6.23, the Scripture says it like this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you understand that the judgment does come? And it comes on people that are good if they violate these principles. But you also need to know that our world has been in a fallen condition since Adam and Eve. And the results of that fallen condition do produce a harvest that we don't like. And the same is true. If someone sins, that sin not only affects them, but it affects those around them as well. And many individuals receive the, the blowback, if you will, of the result of sin and its harvest in their lives because a family member's sin has affected them. A societal sin affects them. A business sin affects them. And there is no insulation to that because we are in a fallen world. But like what Corey Ten Boone once said, it is very, very true. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. You know, I grew up on the Gulf Coast of Texas, and hurricanes were part of the fall expectation. And the, the quiet part of the storm is in the center. It constantly moves, but as long as you could stay in the center of the hurricane, there is calm. You and I, we are experiencing a hurricane even now. And nothing is more safe for us personally than to find ourselves in the center of the will of God. So let me ask you a question right now. Are you in the center of the will of God? Are you doing what God wants you to do? Is your focus Him? Are you acknowledging His reign in your life? Are you submitting to His authority in every area of your life? If so, you're in a safe place. And if indeed you are in the center of his will, then you can trust whatever God allows you to experience coming from his hand. And you can trust him even in the most difficult times of life. You need to know that. But there's a third thing I want you to see, and that is a large army destroys there in verse 16 through 19, we experience this huge army that is going to destroy a third of mankind who are on the planet. Now, think for a moment. That is a huge thing. Now, I need to tell you that the Scripture is very clear about the number of this army. John was very clear to say, I heard the number ten, uh, twice 10,000 times 10,000. This army is a 200 million strong army. You understand that? This is a, a, a huge army. Wow. The millions in this army. It's uh, unbelievable to us. Now, remember, John was writing this 
when the entire population on the planet was only 150 million. So w when you find this, this uh, two million man army, and I think I misquoted before I said 200, uh, this two million man army, that is overwhelming to us. But you need to realize that that number of people in a, an army is possible today. Are you familiar with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? Does that name ring a bell to you? Most of you, it does not. But how, it was an organization that began with five Asian nations in 1996 with China and Russia as the key leaders. Now today, it is made up of eight different entities, different countries. It is regarded as the alliance of the East and raising <clears throat> a huge army like this is not impossible. In fact, the Chinese army, the red Chinese army today, numbers 2.19 million. So John, seeing this from the first century, which where those numbers were inconce inconceivable, now <laughs> they are to us. And we realize that this is huge. And this army brings worldwide destruction and a third of the population is killed. That's, about, that's not thousands, it's not millions, it's about a billion people lose their lives during this moment. The war machines are, are described. The horses and riders uh, with, with uh, uh, heads of lions describe intelligence in these war machines under the leadership of a king a descriptive of a king is very clear. The war machines and their colors are stark. In fact, he describes the breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow, which gives us a hint of the nation's colors that they represent. I want you to look at uh, a couple of flags. Look at the flag of Russia and look at the flag of China. This is the Russian flag. This is the Chinese flag. Do you see the colors that uh, these two key nations hold in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? These are the colors. Show the uh, Russian flag one more time. Wow. The red, the blue, the Chinese, the red, the yellow. That's the description here. Is this uh, army coming out of this alliance of the East? We don't know, but it sure seems to be. Now, you look at this, who could possibly destroy one-third of the world's population? Remember, in the judgment of the fifth trumpet, they, people couldn't die. Now they get to. And this is a sad commentary. And if you think about a billion people losing their lives, think about what it would take to deal with the burials of all of those people. It's an overwhelming task. How are these people killed? The Bible says plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur uh, that came from these war machines. I don't know about you, but I think... The Scripture is trying to describe to us a global nuclear war led by this federation of powers. We have so worried about that for years. One day it's coming. You know, as we look at this, the study of human history has honestly been the study of war, and that's what we see happening it seems like God is saying, you have wanted to destroy each other for decades. Have at it. And that's exactly what happens. 
a third of the population is annihilated. But even more stark in this passage that we have looked at is this unrepentant remnant. In verses 20 and 21, what a picture of hardened hearts. As we look at this, that even after all of this judgment, the remaining population does not repent. They don't turn to God whatsoever. In fact, the Bible describes very clearly what they do and why they did not repent. Three things. Number one, they did not stop worshiping demons. You know why? Because everybody's got to have a God. And honestly, during this time, people want a God that aligns with their wants. And so, either you choose the evil one and his hordes to worship and follow, or you choose the Lord. They would not stop worshiping demons. They, second, they did not stop worshiping idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. They have no power to see, to walk, or act, but what is that describing? Basically, mankind is saying, I want my materialism, not God's plan of economy. That's why people don't repent. They love things that please their flesh. And then the Bible says they did not stop their murders, their magic arts, immorality, or thefts. In essence, what they're saying is, I want my way, not God's plan. It's curious here, uh, murders. Look at that with gun control and the issues that we face. Do you realize that the uh, cities, listen to this, the cities that have and the states that have the strictest gun controls have the most murders. Do you think in reality that gun control is going to stop murder? No, it will not. It's ridiculous. And that's what the Scripture tells us. People will head that way. Murder. Magic arts. You know what the Greek word here? This is not magic tricks. This is the Greek word pharmakon, where we get pharmacy. Drug abuse it will continue on. That's why people don't repent. They want to appease their flesh. Immorality, do you know what that Greek word is? Porneas. That is pornography. That's where we get that word. And thefts, klepto is the Greek word. That's where we get the word kleptomania. You and I need to realize that these people do not stop their wants. Even though a third of the population is destroyed, a third of the population is gone. It is not a wake-up call for people during this time. Wow. What causes a person's heart to be hardened? Well, I, I think Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, gives us a glimpse of why that happens. Why don't you look at this? This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, <clears throat> because of the hardening of their hearts who, having become callous, gave themselves up to lust, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Wow. Let me give you a couple of things about the progression of a hardened heart. A decision to have your way regardless, that'll harden your heart. A decision to no longer be open to the facts. You find yourself wanting your way, and you're not open to understand that there's a possibility that you could be wrong, your heart will get hard. Third, a decision to walk away from God. You know, you, I didn't say you're walking away from acting spiritual, but you're, act, you're moving away from God and you're spiritually wrong and in complete sin. Literally, that's what the description is. But you're still walking away from God, though you may have an appearance of being spiritual. And then a decision to give yourself over to the desires 
of your flesh. That hardens your heart. The deeper you go into sex and filth and greed, your heart gets hardened and calloused. And that's the description of the individuals on the planet during this time. You keep living this way, the result will be insensitivity to the person of God, indifference to the people of God, and intolerance to the plan of God. You need to know that. And let me ask you a question. Doesn't that sound much like our world today? Sadly, I think that that's exactly what's happening. It's like the hearts of so many are so hardened. Maybe that's like someone you know today. Maybe that's you right now. So what should be the response? Repent. If that's where you are right now and you find your heart being hardened, this is a time to repent. And what does that mean? To acknowledge where you are and have a change of mind. To change your mind. It's the Greek word that describes literally a changed mind. That's what repentance is about. To acknowledge your sin and then allow God to change your mind and you head in the opposite direction. And honestly, I need to tell you, repentance is the key to holiness. Repentance is the key for peace. Repentance is the key. It is the turning point in our lives. Many of us, we're living in such a day that what is right has been so watered down and, so, and what is wrong has been so embraced that many of us have compromised and do not understand that there is a right and a wrong regardless of what our culture has said. And I would say to you as a child of God, make sure your heart is right before you try to clean up somebody else's life. Remember what Jesus says, you need to take the two by four out of your eye rather than trying to, to get the splinter out of someone else's. Oh, man. I don't know where you are today, but this passage is sobering to me in an understanding of what is to come, and it terrifies me. I don't want anyone to experience any of that, and that's why I stand in this pulpit week after week to tell you about what the Bible says about what is to come. And you and I need to have that sobering mentality to realize, once again, we don't have long. And maybe God has invited you here today to watch, to listen, to experience what this passage has said, to grab hold of your heart right now, where are you? Are you in the center of the will of God? Are you? If not, repent. Repent. And if you are, be busy about the kingdom's work and not just making a living. Thanks for watching Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. Visit higheraim.org for more free resources. There, you can access our daily devotions, sign up for our monthly teaching letter, even download the Higher Aim app, and so much more. Just go to higheraim.org to get started.